Perfect. Welcome to the IHEMP Hour. My name is Dave Craybill. I'm with IHEMP Mission, Michigan. I cannot talk today. We'll get over that. So I have Michigan, Michigan's mission is to educate, inform, and promote the research, development, and cultivation of industrial hemp here in Michigan and around the world. I have Michigan advocates for wellness in people and the planet through hemp, and it begins with the farmer. Please join our advocacy and join IHEP Michigan. Business members receive a listing in our business directory, which is actively searched by thousands of visitors. And it's only a hundred bucks a year, Mike. Isn't that a good deal? You'd be a fool not to sign up for something like that. Yeah. So what is going on, Mike Brennan? You're down in Ann Arbor. You're about to get invaded oh, with the yeah. hash bash. The marauding hordes will be arriving sometime tomorrow afternoon for hash bash weekend. And uh, it's also great timing, the Michigan spring game. So there'll be 70 or 80,000 folks in the stadium, but another 20,000 are folks here for hash bash so yeah um i'm parking the car on friday night and it ain't going nowhere until uh, at least sunday so because it's going to be at a premium so yeah we're excited uh, for those that haven't attended hash bash i encourage everybody to do it at least once because it's like going to a six it's almost kind of like going to a woodstock kind of thing it's just you know everybody just mellow smoking weed and, and a lot of stuff going on uh, there's the Monroe Street Fair that's not officially part of Hash Bash, but is just behind Hash Bash, where there's going to be food trucks and porta potties and and vendors. Like they can't actually sell there, but they can give it away. You can get samples. So, and like I say, it's going to be what a weekend. Hmm. Very cool. And Blaine. Good well, uh, Mike, you know, I'd love to join you. I hope that I'm still going to be able to make it, but family obligations might uh, prevent me from doing it this year. But I want to wish the, wish the best to you having fun. And um, and, we, and the next time we get on, you can give us a report of that. But hopefully I'll see you there. Yeah, but yeah we're, we're gonna have, we were going to have Dave, but he decided to be Mr. Hockey this weekend. So uh, I, I got cornered. It was late after a skate, and I got cornered in the bar. And so I'm, I'm running a team, so I'm stacking my team. I'm going to... We're going to take it to them. It's going to be fun. Okay. Coming home with some hardware, huh? All right. 60 and over division. But, but I oh, got okay. a couple guys in their 50s. I got some exceptions. So watch yeah. out. <laughs> got some ringers then, huh? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, be fun. Yeah, and your outdoor hockey season has come to the end, obviously. So now it's in. Yeah, you know, we took down the rink. Yeah, we got the yeah. rink down. Four of us did it. We rolled up. This, this tarp is humongous. You know, it's 160 by... Uh, about 60 you know it's a big tar you know rolling that thing i am yeah it, it, it's a wrap for the outdoor hat all right well well we've got a lot of news that we're going to get to uh in the at the near the end of the show um a lot of things have happened uh this week in the hemp industry uh, of course noco is going on right now wish we could be there to to, to uh, see everybody and uh renew old friendships and make mm -hmm. some new ones but Again, this year, family obligations kept me from doing that, but we have wished them the best. They've got a great lineup of speakers, and I'm sure they'll be charged and energized coming back. Um, also, there's been a couple of bills that have been introduced into uh, the um, 2023 Farm Bill, and also some others for um, just been introduced to uh, um, regulate CBD as we need to have it done as we move forward. So a lot of big things happening there, and we're going to talk about Texas. Um, Passing some legislation to make hemp eligible for feed, so uh, a lot of a lot of great things, a lot of good people working behind the scenes for us for sure, and we appreciate all their work. So, but we are extremely excited today to have Glenn Wilcox on. Um, we met Glenn a little bit ago. Glenn is helping us with the um, uh, with the the how the why and how of building with hemp industrial hemp workshops that we're having, and we've got one coming up on the fifteenth uh, in Ann Arbor. And Glenn will talk a little bit about that, where that's going to be. But we're really excited. We had uh, one two weeks ago here in Grand Haven. Uh, great attendance, a lot of good people uh, asking a lot of great questions. And uh, we're excited to be able to go out and share that. We'll have more of those uh, workshops coming up. Plus, also, we'll be having um, some, well, I'm going to call them field days. The summer, we'll actually be able to go out and, uh, and see some of the projects that are being done. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Kim Crow's Fiber Fort. Uh, she's got something coming up this weekend as well. A few spots still available for that. So we'll talk about that later. But uh, Glenn is an educator, a designer, 
uh, a maker whose work engages a large span of materials and processes, both analog and digital. His projects range from furniture to interiors and lighting design to adaptive reuse, boat fabrication, and less categorical investigations. He has always built his own work and values both the physicality of making and, and the material intelligence it requires. Current work focuses on the use of bio-based materials for furniture production and various forms of nomadic dwelling. He often collaborates with Annika, his wife. Uh, just, she's an area ag ag architecture. Together, they have received numerous recognitions, including citation awards in Architecture Magazine's R&D Awards for their carbon fiber research project, Sealith, 2014, a special mention in uh, Architecture's a plus award for the flying carpet project 2014 we got to hear more about that today which also receives the huron valley american institute of architects award 2013 and i'll mention the association of collegiate schools of architectural Fac faculty design awards for hot air 2010 and an honorable mention in the 99,000 house competition 2008 Glenn has a bachelor of agriculture from temple university and a master of agriculture from cornell university when not working on new projects, he'll be dreaming up one while off on an adventure sailing to a distant shore, cycling in the middle of nowhere, or sometimes combining both of them. So, Glenn, welcome to the show today. We are so excited to have you on. What a slacker you are, Glenn. <laughs> you haven't done anything. No, I'm kidding. So, Well, thanks. Thanks so much for the invite. I'm glad to be here to uh, to talk about some of what I do and... and um, to be involved in the in the uh, the workshop on the fifteenth, I'm really looking forward to. I'll actually have some of my my physical stuff uh, I will bring and show, uh, in addition to uh, doing a, a short lecture on it, on stuff too. So I'm happy. And to... Glenn, we're going to have that at the at the is it the Talman? <clears throat> tell me, give me the location again. At the Talman. It's at the Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, um, and it's going to be uh in the in the new edition of that on the ground floor there's a room big big uh uh presentation room 1360 um there'll be plenty of room in there That's on so, north campus isn't it yes it's on north campus it's it's uh the building's actually directly across from the va hospital mm -hmm. you really and you enter it on the uh, the the address is bonnesteel but you really enter it from fuller uh mm -hmm. the parking lots on the back and so that's that how sounds like ann arbor you'd, you'd come in yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you can't get there from here you got to go this way yeah <laughs> you got to go to the back yeah uh, but we, um, we have maps on the website it'll uh it, it, you, the address you can you can google yep, you can find it yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. gps google knows all that's for sure yeah and uh, you know, and it's a great price. Uh, we've got forty dollars uh, and uh, twenty dollars, twenty-five dollars for students. And so, that includes lunch. Yep, that includes lunch. So, please register early if you can for us. That'll help us with getting the lunch numbers correct. So we want to make sure everybody gets a little something to something. something Zingerman's for lunch, or what are you doing for lunch? I don't know. I think we might do Panera on this one, maybe. So we'll oh, see. okay. Yeah. Well, Zingerman is the like home of the twenty-five dollar sandwich. So. Uh... Yeah, yeah great sandwiches, but boy, it's gonna you know cost a big paycheck, you know. Mike, so. this is a hemp event, not a cannabis event. <laughs> oh, right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Forty bucks, not five hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Glenn, how did you get in? It's always interesting to hear people um, how they got involved with the industrial hemp part of things, and so tell us your story. How'd you get involved? This you also do stuff with mycelium too, which we want to talk about. Yeah, that's uh, sort of working with both, and there's there is a relationship between between the two. Um, I'll tell you because because you mentioned some of my other work, the you know carbon fiber, and I worked a lot in um, all, different kinds of composites. I've done a lot of with like concrete casting and and mold making and and EPS foam and all that. And and uh, in uh, in 2017. Um, we, my wife and I, after 20 years of teaching, we went on a sabbatical. Uh, we took uh, 14 months, rented our house out here in Ann Arbor and took 14 months and sailed with our daughter 
uh, up and down the East Coast from Newfoundland down to the Caribbean and back. And um, tried to look for ways to really live uh, in a more sustainable way and travel in a more sustainable way. So mainly using wind and we we had a lot of solar we have a lot of solar power on that and, and a wind generator and one of the things that was striking in that uh in that trip was seeing all of the the results of of climate change uh all along that coast the the higher tides the floods the you know places that were completely flooded or the strength of the storms and and when we came back i i sort of made it made a, a pledge to myself that I would look for ways to use materials that were much more sustainable, much more bio-based uh, materials. And it took me a while to to figure out what that was. And uh, one of the, the striking things that happened was in, in, in 2018, you know, the passage of the of the farm bill, which made industrial hemp uh, legal uh, in in Michigan. Um, I, I immediately you know, try try to acquire some because I wanted to start to start to work with it to understand it as a material. Um, at that time, the only the only time I could I could find stuff was from from North Carolina uh, because you know they had been producing it, been legal to produce it there for a while. So I had a couple bales shipped up, and I just started um, experimenting with it just to see you know what you know. I, I started reading books on hempcrete to see what it was, what the different compositions were. And, um, uh, you know, I just started, um, you know, making, doing sort of small studies, small material studies with it using different mixes. Uh, and I ended up uh, producing, uh, I would say like 150 really sort of small little test, test studies of it. I had this, I made this sort of like slip cast mold where I could just make, you know, one, one sort of mix after another. Uh, and, and experiment with it. And then I had this crazy idea uh, because of the scale that I work on things. You mentioned uh, my, my furniture work uh, and I really, you know, build stuff, uh, very hands-on um, uh, stuff. I had this crazy idea to, to try to make furniture out of, out of hempcrete. Um, and uh, it, I worked on that for about six months with only like one success because uh, I was trying to make these these kind of stool tops out of out of hempcrete and uh, at that scale it doesn't it doesn't work so well at like a small furniture scale it's kind of too brittle to do that you know we know it works really well at a at a at a uh, I mean it's a fantastic material and it works really well at a kind of wall scale. Um, and so I could have gone the route of bu building sort of bigger, kind of dumber uh, furniture, but uh, I had a um, a student who, in one of my classes, and I always get my sort of best ideas from from students, teaching students. They always bring in sort of new materials and things, and she was using this material called mycelium, which uh, has as its substrate it has some sort of agricultural substrate could be hemp, could be straw, could be um, uh, sawdust. You know, there's a lot of different things you can use for it. And I thought, um, you know, th this material looks really interesting because it has the consistency of EPS foam. And could could one use it as a as a, a, a way to build what I was trying to do, build this sort of furniture. And so I did one stool top out of that and it and uh, it was pretty, I was pretty amazed by it. I had, I had actually acquired that material, the mycelium. I can talk more about what mycelium is, but I acquired that material from a company called Ecovative, which is in New York. And I'm not sure if there's any hemp content in it, uh, but uh, it is, uh, you know, a sort of agricultural waste that they use to grow the mycelium on. And so I was using their material, but now I'm at a stage where I'm trying to make my own material. Uh, and I'm using hemp as a substrate for that, which has uh, been pretty positive so far. Uh, but but there's a there's a whole sort of can of worms you open when you try to make your own material. Um, I'm, your own I'm, material. I'm told that in, in growing fungi, that it's very susceptible to bacteria. That it has mm -hmm. to be a very sterile environment. Yep. Yeah, that's right. It's it's. Uh, that's the tricky part. One of the tricky parts of it is you have to 
um, yeah, have a very clean environment, you know, uh, so I've set up a, um, a small lab in my house that I can sort of cordon off and, you know, I keep it, you know, very clean. And then I have, uh, I haven't put it in yet, but I, I'm going to put in a HEPA filter system, uh, to, to get, you know, clean air, but I have one of those, um, you know, those lab glove boxes where I can like, um, you know, move some of the, the material around. Um, it gets, well, do you, I, I should talk about what mycelium actually is. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but, yeah. So, so mycelium is, is essentially the, the body of, uh, of fungi of the, of now fungi is not a plant. It's actually, they call it the, the third kingdom. Yeah. And I, I, I should also be clear. I'm not. I'm not a mycologist or a biologist or anything. So, actually, if there are any mycologists or biologists listening, and I like say something <laughs> wrong, please let me know. I mean, I'm a total amateur in this in this stuff, but I sort of like that position. Um, anyway, mycelium is like is like the the it's the it's the body of the fungi organism which the, the mushroom is the, is the kind of fruiting body from that. So mostly mycelium you don't see because it exists underground and then you'll get, you know, sort of mushrooms sprouting up. It's a bit like, you know, the relationship between a tree and an apple uh, where the apple is equivalent to the mushroom and the, and, and the tree is, is the mycelium. Although mycelium doesn't grow like a tree. It doesn't, it doesn't, well, it seems to branch, but it's more of a, a rhizomatic, uh, system. It looks more like a network than it does uh, uh, a, uh, a branching sort of structure. It sort of looks like a neur neural structure. We saw Avatar, you know, where it, they're all connected. Everything's connected, right? So right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's a lot of people who've written about, uh, you know, you might have heard this term, the, the world wood web, where mm -hmm. people have written about how mycelium proliferates through through forest uh, structures and it, and the trees use it to communicate with each other which is fascinating they don't exactly know how that happens they think it's through electrical impulses through the mycelium anyway mycelium is made up of these single celled strands called hyphae and they're incredibly dense so in if you were in an old growth forest like in Oregon which had a lot of uh, mycelium in it uh, in a handful of, uh, of ground, you would have 26 miles of hyphae. So it's an incredibly dense, wow. you know, complex network. Uh, the, the fascinating thing about mycelium is, is that it also, uh, it, it sort of binds things together. So it acts like a kind of glue when it grows through a substrate, it, it really sort of sticks it together, you know, and it looks, it, it sort of looks like a glue. It can actually be kind of rubbery uh, and, and very dense uh, depending on the, the, the type that you're using. Uh, and so that's the quality of that is what I'm, what I'm interested in. This, there's this, this company, as I mentioned in New York, Ecovative is, uh, and there's a co other companies too. They, they sell a prepackaged mycelium. So you can, you can buy a package of it, 10 pound package, and it's already grown in there. You put it in a mold, you, you, you wrap it in like saran wrap, and then you let it grow for five days. You pull it out of the mold and you dry it out. You can, you can bake it and it's, and it has the consistency of, of a like EPS foam. And hmm. so you could use it to, to replace, replace that um, material. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fascinating. And the interesting thing, well, interesting thing about Ecovative is that they've been able to produce this product. Like it's a growing product, but you can, you can buy it and it works really pretty well. I've ordered a lot of material from them. The problem with it is it's not so cheap to ship overnight because you have to ship it overnight from New York to, you know, 10 pounds of, or 40 pounds. Sometimes I order 40 pounds. So 40 pounds of it is like 500 bucks when you include Whoa. shipping. Whoa. So it's a really boutique material, but it's just a natural material. I should be able to grow it myself. You know, um, they have, they have a lot of patents on the stuff that they do, but I, I don't think they, I'm not sure if they genetically modify the type. I know the type of strain that they're growing, 
but I don't know if they're genetically modified or not. But so what I'm working on now is I've already made a couple things with their material. I'm trying to manufacture my own own material. So I'm kind of reverse engineering theirs and then trying to 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 get my own to grow. I've, I'm now studying like eight different strains of, of fungi to see, you know, which one's the most aggressive, what what grows grows the most, uh, the quickest, you know. Um, and it's fascinating. I, I I've never sort of grown this stuff before. Would uh, being you know as hemp is naturally antibacterial, would that help using it as a substrate for the fungi? Uh, yeah, and it's also very high in 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 nitrates. Uh, one of the things that you um, well, you can you can sort of like train uh, mycelium to almost grow on anything. Like there's this guy uh, Peter Pete McCoy who wrote this amazing book called Radical Mycology. He trained oyster mushrooms to grow on cigarette butts. Oh. You know, there's, there's this whole. There's this whole area of uh, called called mycoremediation where they're teaching, they're training uh, fungi to to like clean soils and uh, you know clean toxins out of out of things. So if you have uh, you know, but different strains will grow on different things. I, my experience so far with growing it on hemp, uh, and also I, I'm one experiment I've mixed uh, hemp with uh, waste from MDF, which contains formaldehyde. Um, mm -hmm. it seems to be growing just fine on that. Uh, mm -hmm. especially strains of oysters I find are extremely robust. There's, there's this other really fascinating. So here, here's the, you, you mentioned, Dave, you mentioned the whole problem. You have to sterilize everything. So you have to, um, you know, I, if I want to grow, my mycelium on like five pounds of substrate, I have to put that in an autoclave or pressure cooker for like two and a half hours to like make sure it's totally, everything in it is killed. Mm. And then I can add some some mycelium to that and then it starts to grow on it. There's another method, which I, I just started this past weekend, where you can take uh, the substrate and just soak it overnight in a in water that has a bit of lime in it, maybe about, uh, you know, 11 to 12 pH solution. And that pasteurizes the material. So you don't need to heat it. And uh, apparently oyster mushrooms really, really like high pH. Uh, anything, uh, any bacterial or, or other types of fungi like a much lower pH. So it like killed the lime kills everything. And then it, it grows in that environment. So you don't have to, so you can eliminate certain aspects of sterilization uh, within growing certain type, certain types of mushrooms. Uh, hmm. And as you're, you know, so there's different stages of this thing. There's like growing stuff on a Petri dish, you know, growing it in a jar and then growing it in big bags of stuff. Um, they, when you're at that small stage, like growing it in a Petri dish, um, you have to be super careful because that Petri dish could, you could use that Petri dish to inoculate like a thousand bags. If that Petri dish is infected with anything, it's going to like ruin, you know, all your, your, your growth, all your bags. So being really careful of sterilization in the small stage, you know, pays off in the big stage, but in the big stage, you don't, you don't have to be as careful. You know, I can like load these bags in my garage. It, it doesn't have to be a super sterile environment. Um, so there's different sort of ranges, but I, I'm just, you know, learning all of this stuff as I go. Uh, getting a vision of your garage. <laughs> it's really, you know, when you're explaining this, I'm thinking, my God, what you got going on there. Is this something that's scalable? Uh, yeah, potentially, but I think it would depend on working really locally. Like if I think if I had if you had like a local source in which I was getting the substrate from, I mean you can you can really grow the mycelium anywhere uh, if you have the right conditions. But the problem is getting getting the substrate from someplace. And I think if you can do it in a in a local way, you're not shipping it you know across country or trying to mm -hmm. ship a sort of live stuff across country. It could certainly be scalable. The 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 ecovative people are 
like they just built a uh, a tiny house that used the mycelium as the insulation because it has like the sim very similar properties as a uh, as um, uh, uh, hempcrete does in terms of its R value, um, and it really really like you know binds to it sticks to stuff really really well. So you could make a panel out of it, you know. Um, you could, the other thing that they're doing, which I haven't done yet is they're making it into a kind of, uh, wood product. So they heat press it, you know, like you would do with, with, with other types of, I think they do that when they produce uh, hemp wood, you know, they'll, they'll get it at a certain stage that it grows. And then they put it in a press, which presses all the water out of it and heats it up and they make something that looks like OSB. Um, so it's. Or you could press it into a mold, into a shape. Um, after you take it out of a mold, it's a bit soft. So you can drape it over stuff uh, before it dries. I mean, it's just, it, it's a it's a pretty interesting material. So, are so, is your... it, so is it easy to work with when you get to the final stage of it? Or I'm, trying to, I'm thinking that, you know, there's a couple ways to do it, right? If we make it into a board, obviously we can cut it. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you, is it more of a... A shaping molding kind of thing well that that's a big part of what i do and 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 how you work with it is that you have to it, it's growing inside something and so the way that i've been working with it is i build molds so i i have to build a mold for you know let's say if i'm i've done a chair and a couple stools and uh i could bring I'll, I'll bring all this stuff i have on the 15th and so you can you can see all this stuff uh, but I build, you know, I use a lot of like CNC and robotic technology to build these these molds. I use I design them on the computer, and then I I cut them out, put them together, uh, and then I I coat them the inside with epoxy to make them very durable. Uh, but then I put the material in, and actually, what I've been experimenting with is uh, the first time the first thing I made out of mycelium, I I it was a mistake the way that I thought of it. I, I always thought of it as a kind of wood and it's not wood. It's, it's sort of more like a kind of upholstery. You know, you really have to think of it like EPS foam and the way that you would use EPS foam um, in, in construction. You wouldn't, you wouldn't depend on it as a kind of structural frame. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. inside the, the stools, I put a core and I find I can use something very, very, uh, uh, you know, simple and cheap and light, like a, like a sauna tube, you know, like a, like a cardboard tube with maybe a, a top, a wood top and a bottom. And that's the core inside the mold. And then the mycelium grows in the kind of maybe about an inch and a half around it. And it bonds to the core. It like that stuff just sticks to everything. And so it bonds to the core and then I can use the core to like attach legs and things to it. You know, so I use the core as a kind of structure. And then the, the mycelium is a kind of upholstery for it, you know, that that you know bonds to this to the structure. So I'm experimenting a lot with like internal, you know, 3D printing, making internal structures to things that get that then have mycelium grow around them. And they can they can be much more structural. You know than a regular sort of EPS, but and but that's common actually in in um, if you look at e any EPS made furniture, it has a most of them have some kind of internal frame uh, that they they grow around. My I would say my my theoretical goal is to make a piece of furniture that's completely compostable, that I could just you could just take it and like throw it in the comp you know when it's done or it, it doesn't it's not going to poison the the ground by by being sort of uh, uh thrown out um that it could actually maybe even add to the soil uh nutrients to the soil so that's that's my end goal but it's it's tough to get sort of all those hit all the right boxes you got to use the right adhesive the right wood you can't have formaldehyde in it can't have metal fittings in it so there's a sort of lot of aspects to it that still need work but that's that's kind of my goal hmm. well, mike, you're, you're you muted yourself mike uh do you see commercial applications for this i mean it sounds really complicated and uh i mean if you're going to get it on a manufacturing level 
I mean, is it, do you see it eventually becoming something that would be used as building materials at a bigger scale? Absolutely. I would say in the, in the, in the mycelium space, it's, it's booming now. It's like, you know, the, the, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of researchers doing all kinds of different things at different levels. Uh, the, the Ecovative company, which is now, I think it was created in 2009 by two, uh, students from, from, uh, Rhode Island school of design who came up with this material in their class. You know, they, they started to work with it and then they made this company. It's a $60 million company now. Wow. They're, they're ma manufacturing a lot of one of the main things that they're using it to replace is all the styrofoam that's used in packaging. Yeah, it makes it completely compostable. You can just sort of take the packaging and just, you know, throw it in the ground and it'll, you know, uh, and so that's a, that's a big part of their market. Uh, and then other people, there actually, there's uh, companies now making a faux leather out of mycelium. Uh, hmm. When you, they can make it without a, an, a, out a substrate in it, and so it, it looks and feels a lot like leather. Um, yeah, there's just. I'm sure, the cows appreciate that too. Right? <laughs> so, uh... Eat more chicken. No bull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, the other thing too now, uh, I mean, uh, we're, obviously everybody in the know knows that hemp building materials are fireproof and a lot of advantages. However, there's still a lot of, as far as I can tell from being on the show for a couple of years, the, uh, the, the, the fire inspectors and the folks that control the cities and the counties haven't really bought into it. It's like, hmm, I don't know. So do you think this is something they would buy into? Yeah, I think there. I think there. There are people like you know these companies that are producing this stuff that have a, a huge interest in you know making sure that things are safe and that they they can be approved and used in as as building products. Uh, it it seems that that's a lot like where this where this company uh, is going and other people are looking at. And yeah, I I would be very interested because it does have if you use the you know, hemp as a substrate for it, it has all those qualities, those like, you know, anti, um, uh, you know, fire, uh, really good fire rating, really good insulation, um, you know, really, really great qualities to it. Good, good thermal properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's got a lot of advantages. It's just uh, mm -hmm. still kind of on an experimental level right now. I think that would be safe. Yeah. Well, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, still, still definitely. I mean, it's so, I mean, yeah, like I said, that, that company was 2009. Um, it's, it, everything's really, really pretty new in it. And so there's just a lot of people trying to figure out, you know, oh, what can I do with this? You know, which is kind of what I'm doing. I'm like, this is a fascinating material. What, what are its possibilities? You know, what, so what are really its adhesive, its adhesive qualities to, uh, that's one of the things I'm studying. Yeah, a long time ago, I worked out at a Seattle newspaper and covered Weyerhaeuser. And I was, you know, uh, the big lumber makers, I was wondering, is there something that would cause them to want to buy into this? Because they're the ones that, you know, then you get into the huge scale if you can get the warehousers of the world on board. Yeah, I think if they could make a, if they could make a sheet product out of it, um, that would, you know, they would they might buy into it i would say is there's it more, is it used more for interior stuff more than exterior at this point yeah definitely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interior i i had my student who introduced me to it that i was working with she um she's actually much more interested in like um you know making something out of it and having that thing continue to grow so she doesn't she doesn't use the process of like killing the mycelium, which you do through through heating or drying. Um, she so she takes her stuff. She's more of an artist. So she takes it and she like leaves stuff outside and see if it like continues to grow. You know, these sort of structures, which are a bit a bit, you know, human made and a bit natural, you know, some combination. So they'll like continue to grow mushrooms, which is fascinating. Um, but 
I, I was surprised by she left some of these pieces out outside for uh, uh, over a year, you know, through Michigan winter, and they they didn't they didn't corrode or or wear you know wear. They were like actually in pretty good shape. Um, hmm. So I've been I, one of the other things I was doing both with my the hemp hempcrete studies and also I'm um, doing with mycelium are different ways to seal it. So how do you um, you know, can you seal it with wax or use, I'm experimenting with bioplastics, seaweed based bioplastics, you know, can I, can I sort of create a coating for it that would protect it um, is, is one of my interests also. Well, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor. And then we want to ask you about the flying carpet. I've got that. <laughs> Blaine, want, he I wants to, to use that to fly over from Muskegon over to Ann Arbor tonight. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to thank uh, Egg Marbles and Heirloom Grove uh, for helping sponsor the show. Um, they have a great line of products. One of the products I love to use is their BioFreeze. I had a little fall uh, a couple of days ago in my ribs, and I've been putting that on there. And boy, I'll tell you what, at night it really helps me. It takes that pain away. It helps me quite a bit with that. So can you, can you, there we go. So they've got a great line of some bath bombs that they have. Um, it's one of the things. Uh, they're located uh, up near Mount Pleasant is where they're at. And um, the CBD bath soaks. There's some of their oatmeal, milk, and honey uh, bars. Their creamy lavender. And um, So they have three different kinds of uh, bath soaks here. Rosemary mint. Creamy lavender and honeysuckle. What's your favorite, Dave? You know, I haven't experienced them yet. Ah. I know Becky would like the lavender. She's always a lavender kind of person for oh, sure. That's for relaxation. She's around here, mm -hmm. so she needs to relax. Well, and I'm pretty high. I'm pretty, I'm pretty high. high stress. <laughs> I do. I'm sure I do. Without a doubt. Um, yeah, so the so the CBD bath strokes have got three kinds. I think you mentioned those on there. Um, 300 milligrams CBD in them. Uh, and they're $30 a jar, what those jars go for. And the soap goes for about $10 a bar. And so I encourage you to go check out Heirloom Grove, their website. They're always coming out with new stuff. Jamie and Mike are You great. don't eat that, Mike. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, it's not edible. Edible. Okay, got it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like you could, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I see a little oatmeal right on top. There, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do. So, very cool. But, yeah, well, great products they come out with. So, again, we want to thank them very much for their helping out with helping the show and what mm -hmm. they do there. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get back to talking to Glenn. I I, I need to find out. What what's the deal with the flying carpet? What's what's <laughs> unique about this? Ah, uh, yes, the your wife there too. Right. Yeah, that's my wife. Um, so the the flying carpet actually, if you look in the upper left hand corner, that's uh that's a picture of the the first flying carpet we've done. We've done a couple, and um, uh, the way it came about was my wife. This was uh at my daughter's school. This is Angel Elementary in, mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor yep. and uh, a school that my, my daughter went to. And uh, my wife happened to be on a committee uh, at the school that was somebody had donated $10,000 to, um, to um, you know, buy some new furniture for, for this uh, particular area in the school that was a kind of, that could have been a, a um, you know, a sort of uh, uh, free sort of uh, study reading area. And so they asked, because my wife was an architect, they asked her, hey, could you look through these catalogs and pick out some furniture that can go there? And she looked through the catalogs and she said, this stuff is garbage. Uh, we can take the $10,000 and make something great and amazing and we'll do it, you know, pro bono. We won't, we won't charge any of our own labor and, and design time. And uh, so we came up, we went through a lot of design uh, iterations, and then we came up with this. This is actually uh, the, the, the form of the flying carpet. What we actually produced was a kind of system to make it. 
So I wrote, uh, I do actually a lot with, I know I'm working with mycelium and hemp, but I do actually teach and do a lot with computation and, and coding. I write computer code that generates things I'm trying to make. So I wrote a computer code to, to make a system to, to make this design, but we could vary it in all different ways. It was like a system that, that worked in a, a lot of different ways. And we, uh, uh, it outputs files that we can then cut on a CNC. So then we cut it all in a CNC and then we glue it all together, all these sections. And uh, this particular piece, the first one is a, is a single piece of furniture that's divided. I think it's divided into nine sections. It all comes together. It's 65 feet long wow. and it, it, it fits uh, on, uh, it's on the second floor of Angel School, sort of right outside their auditorium. And this picture was, I came in uh, about a week or two after we had finished installing it over the summer, school was in session. Uh, I came in just to see how it was being used. And this is what I found. It was covered with kids, just cool. you know, reading, playing, uh, you know, doing all sorts of things on it. It's supposed to be a little like, uh, you know, a little question, the sort of line between playing and school you know it's a bit like a bit of a provocation you know for what furniture can be too to like get the students to like think outside the sort of normal uh furniture uh and so anyway some we never advertised it or anything but we people would see the pictures of it online and contact us and say hey could you build a flying carpet for us or they thought it was a product that we were selling um but it's really a kind of one-off thing. So we did another one. There's other, the other pictures are, we did another one for a school in Ohio. Uh, yeah, that's a kind of three different ones just because of the way that the, the, the hallway that they wanted in was organized. Uh, and then we've, we've done proposals for a couple other schools and a couple of restaurants, but haven't, haven't built anything from that. It's actually not, it's, it's quite labor intensive to make it. Um, so, it, you know, really the cost of it is about $300 a linear foot or so, 300, 350. But if you think about it, you know, if you were pricing out custom cabinets, which is just a box, a lot of custom cabinet work is between $500 and $1,200 a linear foot. So it's $300 a linear foot isn't too bad, but it does require, uh, you know, you can see all the way over on the right. Yeah. So it all has to get glued and clamped together manually. And then all that has to be sanded, it has mm. to be belt sanded by hand. That well, that takes a huge amount of time. Very labor oh, intensive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, extremely labor intensive. So um, so we really haven't done any more than the two. I, I do another. I mean, I like doing them and I have the computer code already written. And so it's it's the stuff is output from it. But uh, well, how big are the sections? I clearly it's not 65 foot section. Is it like 10 foot sections or what? Uh, it, it's actually determined. Uh, it's a good question, Mike. It's actually determined by uh, our CNC machine, which has an eight foot bed. Uh -huh. And so the, the although we can divide up, uh, we can overlap, you know, the parts when we go from when we're laying them up, they do overlap. But we're sort of limited in terms of the what we can cut and then also just shipping it you know we need to get it in sections on a truck so generally they're about you know between eight and eight and ten feet uh in in length total length each section um just to make it easier to, to move them around fun all right well let's uh cycle back to hempcrete and you did 150 different samples and i'm, I'm assuming you tried different binders and such yeah you have any big takeaways from that that work well i you know it's something i want to go back to because the, what i ended up doing was and i didn't uh i didn't like that it might have had to do with the scale that i was working at uh but i i was always ended up adding a little bit of uh, uh, cement to what I was doing. Mm. And uh, I have, I was able to acquire a bag of, uh, of hydraulic lime, which has natural po pozzolans in it, 
the 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 place I get, I got it from a place in Pennsylvania, but they get it from France because there's a big there's a much of course you guys know there's a big there hemp construction was was never stopped in Europe, and so there's a lot of knowledge over there. And so the 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 this French lime, I don't think I have to add uh, cement to it, but uh, it has a natural pozzolans in it. Uh, and then uh, I, be, I was adding, I had very good uh, results with um, uh, cutting the lime with metacalin. Um, so you, using a bit of uh, the, the clay metacalin. Uh, and so doing a mix that was a bit, you know, probably, probably 50 lime, 50 metacalin. And then uh, also good results with, instead of cement, I use slag and fly ash uh, as, as replacements. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's, that's something I want to, I think I could do it all with hydraulic lime. So I don't know what the, the sort of mixes that I'm interested to know from this workshop. I'm actually interested to hear what different mixes that people are using, um, to, to get good, uh, good binding results. Yeah. I'll bring you, uh, I'll bring you some, uh, I, I bought some agricultural lime from T TSC, a tractor supply company. Mm -hmm. It was, I forget, you know, maybe 50 bucks, but it was a you know, big bag. And uh, that seemed to work well. I, I have some samples I'll bring down. So, yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm excited that your students are engaged in this process and they're taking us to a new and more sustainable future. So we, we appreciate that. Yeah, I actually just because um, I, I, you know, I've been maybe working with this stuff for about two years, and I just proposed a uh, a, a course next fall called called Biomaterials for Designers, and the response from the students has been overwhelming. Like the Excellent. course filled up in about ten minutes, and I just keep getting emails from students that want to take it, and they're they're just telling me their interest in mycelium and hemp and. They want to, you know, use these materials. They want to learn how to how to how to use them, uh, and it's just, yeah, this the generation. They're very interested in these these you know these technologies and these materials. Cool. All right, well, Glenn, well, we're going to look look forward for your talk at the at the uh, workshop for sure. Um, I think uh, a lot of people will be interested in hearing about all this and where it's going, and you know, sure, sustainable yeah, sustainable sure. is what we're going for here, folks. That's for sure. Yeah. So. All right, we'll stick around to the end, Glenn, because we're going to get to another fun topic, eating food. <laughs> doesn't right use there. any mycelium in his recipe, though. So, I mean, you know. You know what? You know, I, you know, I should have been more prepared. I should have done yeah. something with mushrooms today. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I should have done. That's it. Yeah. It's shrooms. So. All right. Well, we want to give a shout out to Kim Crows, who's helping us out with the, the Hemp Crete Workshop, the Hemp Building Workshop. She has her own event this saturday in detroit and i understand there's still a couple slots left blaine i think so she's had a couple in the morning and uh, i think there's probably some in the afternoon as well so so you can find kim at fiberfort.com or, or reach out to us we'll connect you with her um you can find her on facebook at fiberfort.com here's her flyer was there something else you wanted me to share blaine um, not with that. I think we did the, uh, the heirloom grove. So we'll talk about that again a little bit, but yep. no, I think that's All about right. it right now. Okay. Well, let's, let's, uh, I know we have some Kim, news. Kim has a lot of knowledge to share. So, uh, she'll be a really great one to share a lot of knowledge and she's doing a lot of projects, working on a lot of things, uh, this summer with hemp building projects. So mm -hmm. she'll have a lot of great information to share. All right, Mike Brennan, I know you've got some breaking news. I, I saw it come over across in the 420 post. It sounds like some people in Lansing were misbehaving. What's oh, going on there? They always are, but in this case, they got caught. So <laughs> uh, it goes back to the medical marijuana licensing days, and a guy named Steve Linder, anybody in the industry has heard of him, used to be the lobbyist for the Michigan, what was it, uh, the Cannabis Manufacturers Association, which represented the big cannabis players. But that doesn't involve them in this particular case. However, there is a federal investigation, and uh, Linda is the focus of that, along with former House Speaker Rick Johnson, uh, which was kind of a, uh, I've got to be careful because this is still, this is not officially litigation. 
and it's a source-based story, so one has to be careful what one says. But uh, they're targeting of a barbary investigation, apparently, to get licenses, a little money under the table will facilitate the situation kind of thing. And that doesn't make the federal government really, really happy, you know. So they're, that's going on right now. Um, and uh, the, the whole and, thing is kind of interesting because it's federally illegal to begin with. So right. they're investigating a contract that was entered into illegally through yep. bribery for an illegal activity, according to the feds. Yep. It's so lots of illegal of stuff people. there. So it's, uh, it, it's going to take a while to shake itself out. Uh, however, it's, uh, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, I suspect a lot of this goes on. It's just sometimes, you, you know, they get away with it and sometimes they don't. And in this case, it doesn't appear they did. Uh, so, but we'll wait to see. And I don't think charges have been levied yet. So you've got to be really careful with a story like this, but, uh, it does kind of raise your eyebrows a little bit and go, Hmm. So we'll see what happens. And so we'll keep on top of this, uh, uh, and uh, see what happens. And we'll write it up uh, as the you know situation changes or develops as it were. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, as gosh, I don't have to tell anybody on this show. Uh, that the hash bash is this weekend in Ann Arbor. It starts officially Saturday morning. And it's and as, as I said at the beginning of the show, if you're thinking of coming, come very, very early because it's also the spring football game. So parking is going to be a nightmare. Uh, one of the good things, though, uh, again, if you're a consumer, and I know some people in, in the hemp industry are, we won't name names, um, are, Anyway, there's a there's a group called uh, Sons and Daughters United, and they're working with Ryan Basor to get cannabis convictions expunged from people's records. So they have a special deal for this weekend, uh, $40 donation. Go to sonsanddaughtersunited.org, I think it is, and buy uh, a, a ticket to get this map. I actually have my QR code right here. I'm Right after the show, I'm going to go out and begin to – Check this out. And so he spent $40. It's, it's a tax-deductible donation. Good thing there, right? Helps people get their records expunged. And in return, there's 10 or 12 dispensaries around town, and we've got a slug of dispensaries in this town, that will give you free products, pre-rolls or various other assorted items with a value of about $200. Uh, so 40 buck investment, you get a five-time return, plus it's tax-deductible. I don't see any downside in any of this. And then you're going to get some nice product. Uh, the one thing about the hash bash, if you do come, there are no sales at the hash bash uh, as of THC products, I mean. So you have to bring your own. So if you do this deal, you'll have your own and then you can freely consume. I mean, this is Ann Arbor. Heck, when I was a student here, it was a $5 fine if you got caught with marijuana smoking and you mailed it in like a traffic ticket. I think it's about $25 now, but, you know, inflation and all that. But, <laughs> uh, again, if you're, you're coming here, uh, and, and you know, come, come early because it really starts to kick off at about 8 or 9 in the morning. And then Monroe Street Fair, we're partnered with Str Charlie Strackbine, who puts on the Monroe Street Fair. And that's the sort of commercial side of Hash Bash. Hash Bash is just a protest movement which is on the diag in front of the graduate library. Anybody that's been to Ann Arbor knows where that is. Big brass M in the middle of it there. Uh, but the hash, but the Monroe Street Fair is where there's going to be vendors. Again, they're not selling, but they're giving stuff away. There's also food trucks there. There's also porta potties there. And uh, as we were saying in the beginning, I looked at the weather report. It's going to be like 40, 45 degrees and windy. Dress warm because you're going to be outdoors all day long. And uh, that can be brutal if you're not dressed correctly. Right, guys? Yes, sir. Yep. There's no such thing as bad weather. It's just bad clothing. So That's mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yep. So those are the two highlights. We've got some great uh, litigation soon to come in, in, in Lansing. Some people are going to go down, I think, for that. And at the same time, we've got some uh, good news. We've got the big hash bash tomorrow. But, again, come early because between the football game and hash bash, I'm guessing 100,000 people in town – Besides the regular people that are in town, you know, so mm -hmm. busy, busy. Excellent. Well, be safe out there. 
I'll do my best. Do you have any uh, news? Yeah, I know we, we want to talk about that. Uh, we're we're going to be doing an article about this legislation and something we we got snookered on uh -uh. supporting. Uh, so you want to touch base on that? Well, I think we'll carry that on, but it, it has to do with, um, again, some support that we thought was going one way, and we just got notified yesterday that it may be a little bit of a backdoor kind of thing to actually hurt the CBD industry more than help it. And um, so we're going to we're going to look at that and and take a stance on that uh, as we move forward with that. So um, but there are some legislation been introduced for um, uh, also for the one uh, percent um, has been has been introduced. And um, also in Texas, which is pretty interesting, you know, we've been talking about a long time about the grain and being able to use that as a feed adder for livestock. Well, Texas, as well as Montana, now Texas has just passed, uh, approved for hemp seed derived feed for horses and chickens, poultry. So um, we're going to keep working on this and we're going to try to see if we can't get something here. Uh, the Michigan legislation also to take a look at this and maybe pass some stuff. Um, the the, the uh, American Feed Association really doesn't want it to be done on a case by case basis, but it's ridiculous the amount of uh, what they're having everybody jump through for these. Yeah, thanks, Dave, um, for doing that. And um, so good to see this happen. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. But hopefully we can get this approved here in Michigan, too. Um, there's all kinds of studies that have been done um, uh, already and, and continue to be done. Um, you know, you and I or anybody can go to the store. We can buy hemp parts. We can buy hemp oil. Um, but yet, you know, we're not able to use it you know, for livestock yet on a commercial basis. Feeding your own, it's okay, but otherwise it's not. So We're I'm still not. suffering from the reefer madness syndrome that's been plaguing the industry well, for 80 years, you know. So. Yeah, it's a little bit of that. And, and, and you know, we want to make sure, obviously, that, you know, that, 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 the, that the animals are safe, right? They don't have anybody to speak for them. We don't have Dr. Doodle, unfortunately. Um, but if we did, maybe that helped. But, you know, other countries have been doing this for years, right, been feeding it. So, yeah, um, we'll see where it goes. But we really want to shout out to the USF Feed Coalition for their hard work that they're doing, support them. There will be, um, as we move forward with this new farm bill, there will be opportunities that we'll need everybody to help with to uh, contact their legislators to make sure that they're in support of this and sign on to these bills. Maybe we can get this regulation finally through this Congress. Um, right now, you know, I don't say it's a wild west, but certainly there's a lot of CBD products and a lot of CBD manufacturers that are not putting out a good product. Um, and we want to make sure that it's safe uh, for consumers to use and kids um, and also the animals. We want to make sure the animals you know, are okay too with their feet. So um, we'll keep talking about it. We'll keep preaching it and uh, we'll keep you updated on these bills as they come in. But today we have a delicious recipe. So here we go. My little hat I got on. So roasted sweet potatoes with apricots and curried hemp seed is what we got today. Um, I'm going to bring up my page here, Dave, so I can read a little better. There we go. Uh, this makes about four to six servings. It takes about an hour. Um, and this recipe, uh, I like to give credit where credit's due on things because this is not my own recipe. This is from the Hemp Nut Cookbook, a really great cookbook for anybody that's looking to do um, any, any cooking with hemp or hemp seed oil. Uh, this dish is good for any occasion. The ingredients are healthy with the curried hemp seed makes for a yummy side dish. So the ingredients here, they, you know, some sweet potatoes, um, apricots, hemp seed oil, uh, zest of two lemons, sea salt, curry powder, shelled hemp seeds, uh, freshly parsed, parceled mints, mints, minced, <laughs> I can't even say it. Uh, so if you don't know where to get the hemp seed oil or the, to get the, uh, uh, the hemp parts, if you go to down on the farm dot biz, we can always, we can, we can supply that for you. It's not a problem with that. And these are the instructions here. For it. And you can find this recipe and many, many more recipes right here where it says that we're on our website under the ihempmichigan.com uh, under events. And you look there, oops, uh, nope, under about, and it has hemp, hemp recipes there. So we've you got gotta probably, have what? You gotta have a hundred or more in there by now, don't you? I would, yeah, I would say oh, we have to have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. Well, Glenn, uh, look forward to. Shaking your hand and on the April 15th and working together on that 
tent building workshop that's going to be a good event okay. yeah so drive in ann arbor on saturday glenn i'm just telling you you know so. no i don't i don't go out when there's a game like i know i the, the first i i live back here in 99 by the stadium and mm. i made that mistake once where i went out while the game was getting out I, oh. It took me three hours to get home. Oh, yeah. that's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. You have to get your bike out and ride around on it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Get down there. Or get one of those. I'm watching these kids go by here. They're standing up on those little electric scooters, balancing with no helmets. That's okay yeah. until the first crash, right? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, yeah. to be, uh, well, we want to thank we want to thank everybody for tuning in and Mike. You're always interesting when you can bring on that the other side of the other yeah, side of the, the dark side, there, side of the force. That would be <laughs> you know you got so, uh, you have cookies over there, so it's okay. We like yeah that, so. okay right. and thanks, Glenn. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Cool. See you in two weeks, right? Yep, two weeks. Two, two weeks. weeks. Okay.